in Farm Girl who finds herself suddenly the darling of the media and the darling of Los Angeles. And I don't think she could handle it. How do you get time by yourself when you're the object of that kind of fascination and that kind of scrutiny? And how do you get off the stage? How do you do that gracefully? Not long after her return to Los Angeles on May 18, 1926, Sister Amy and her secretary went to nearby Venice Beach. There, something happened that would set the entire city abuzz. The secretary, watching McPherson swim from the beach, suddenly lost sight of her. After walking up and down the beach for quite some time, really terrified, she finally notified the hotel manager nearby that uh, Sister Amy had disappeared. Minnie Kennedy was convinced that um, Amy had drowned. Sister had been advertised to speak at the temple at night, and when the crowds got there, Minnie was there and Sister was not. And Minnie conducted the entire service without saying anything, even though rumors had circulated in the city suggesting that Amy had disappeared. And the parishioners sitting in the back could hear the newsboys outside shouting, Amy McPherson believed drowned. A few began sobbing. At the end of the service, Minnie Kennedy announced what the congregation had feared. Sister, she said, is with Jesus. But not everyone was convinced. One young journalist in this period believed that Amy had not actually drowned, but that this was a well-orchestrated publicity stunt, that this was going to be some sort of story of death and resurrection or redemption, and that Amy was going to come back. For 32 days, followers of Sister Amy held a vigil at the beach where she had disappeared. Meanwhile, the woman who had so skillfully used the media to promote her ministry was now the subject of a media frenzy. The press were having a field day with this story. And what they discovered was that McPherson's former radio engineer, a guy named Kenneth Ormison, had also disappeared around the same time Amy did. So rumors began spreading, and the newspapers sensationalized this, that maybe she had escaped away with him. Then, in the early morning hours of June 23rd, 1926, police knocked on the door of the parsonage at Angela's Temple, presenting Minnie Kennedy with stunning news. Her daughter had apparently walked out of the desert in Mexico and was in a hospital in Arizona. Amy Semple McPherson was alive. Minnie provided questions to verify her daughter's identity, questions that only Amy would have known, questions that had to do with the name of the dog on the farm in Ontario, things like that from her childhood. Amy's mother, her two children, and LA reporters all raced to the Arizona hospital to learn what had happened. McPherson's account was soon taken up by the silent film industry, which made theatrical versions of current events. Sister Amy's story is that while she was at the beach, a man and a woman approached her and they said, Sister, our baby is dying. Would you please come with us and pray for our child? They dragged her into the car and they chloroformed her. And when she woke up, she was in a shack in the desert. McPherson said she was taken to Mexico by kidnappers named Steve and Mexicali Rose. She was bound but managed to escape by severing ropes on the rim of an open tin can. There were some doubts first raised by someone in Arizona who said that her clothing and her shoes did not look as worn as he thought they would have if her story of wandering across the desert terrain had been true. On the face of it, this story sounds outrageous. But in fact, the FBI had been investigating a number of kidnapping rings in Southern California and just a few months earlier, a wealthy white Angelino had been kidnapped and taken down to Mexico. I've never believed the kidnapping story. The names themselves, Mexicali Rose, the whole story is far too melodramatic. I've always believed that up until this point, Amy felt that she was somewhat in control of her life. 
but that at this point she was so tired and exhausted that she really wanted to leave behind everything. When she returned to Los Angeles, 30,000 people greeted Sister Amy at the train station. But the press didn't share her followers' unquestioning loyalty. And the rest of the year, the second half of 1926, would be taken up with raking Amy Semple McPherson over the coals and trying to penetrate every aspect of the story that she told about where she'd been during the six weeks of her absence. McPherson was now under the gaze of reporters across the entire nation, with articles in elite magazines such as Vanity Fair, Harper's, and The New Republic. The New York Times would publish as many articles on Sister Amy's saga as it had on the entire Scopes trial. Well, nowadays, celebrities do have some sense of what they're getting in for. In the 20s, that wasn't necessarily the case. These people who were moving into celebrity, the Mary Pickfords in, in film, and the Babe Ruths in, in sports, and the Amy Semple McPhersons in religion, they didn't know really what the rules were going to be and how it would change their lives. Within weeks of McPherson's return, the Los Angeles district attorney launched a grand jury investigation into her alleged kidnapping. At the hearing, everyone expected the DA to focus on whether there was enough evidence to identify and charge kidnappers in the case. And almost immediately, it's clear that the district attorney is not interested in finding out about Steve and Rose and these supposed kidnappers, but they're interested in prying into Amy's private sexual life. The DA grilled McPherson about her relationship with Kenneth Ormiston, implying that she had concocted the sensational kidnapping story to hide an affair. Ultimately, it was not kidnappers that he charged, but McPherson, with fabricating evidence, lying before a grand jury, and conspiracy to commit a hoax. He even argued that McPherson should go to jail. Before McPherson's case went to trial, famed journalist H.L. Mencken came to town to investigate the story firsthand. Mencken was no friend to old-time religion, having written only scathing articles during the Scopes trial about Amy's anti-evolution ally, William Jennings Bryan. Everyone expected him to carve McPherson into pieces as well. H.L. Mencken would attend the temple when he would visit Los Angeles, and then he'd write columns and say things like, you know, Los Angeles is Reverend's sister in God, did this or that, in a very mocking and belittling way. But as he began to investigate the trial, Mencken really captured what was going on in Los Angeles. And that is that if you want to discredit somebody's political agenda, you go after their private sex life. And that's exactly what Amy's enemies were doing. Mencken learned that McPherson had been lobbying to get evolution out of California schools and Bibles into every classroom. He concluded that the same LA civic leaders who had once promoted her were now pressuring the DA to pursue her because they feared her efforts to merge faith and politics were embarrassing their modern city. The whole episode, Mencken wrote, was a dirty shame. In the end, the district attorney did not have incontrovertible evidence that McPherson had lied, and the charges were dropped. But the damage to her reputation had been done. Angela Temple will carry on, and we shall win many thousands of souls. Let's sing that chorus, if we all pull together. Huh? After the kidnapping saga, Sister Amy struggled to regain her public image. Given a chance to star in a film about her life, she lost weight and bobbed her hair, but failed the screen test. She opened a show about her life on Broadway, but disappointed critics and audiences alike by refusing to talk about the kidnapping. The show closed in a week. She was named in dozens of lawsuits, and she even became estranged from her own mother and daughter. 
She also briefly married a singer from one of her productions. So she decides to elope with Dave Hutton to the horror of church members who believed that divorcees should never remarry, that to do so was to commit adultery. And this really alienated her even further from members who had stuck by her through the kidnapping, but were now totally confused, wondering what in the world their leader was doing. And they'd find themselves then distracted by Amy in the news from doing the work that they had undertaken to do. And so some of them actually withdrew and formed a new denomination. Sister Amy's tale tells us what happens when a person is forced into isolation, um, either through fame, uh, through their great gifts. All of us need to be connected. And it's not enough for a great performer such as Amy uh, to be connected simply to a crowd and to her followers. In the 1930s, as Amy Semple McPherson grappled with how to revitalize her crippled ministry, the nation was in the grip of economic depression. For McPherson, the hard times presented an opportunity to minister once again to the disenfranchised, to return to the roots of the Pentecostal movement. Pentecostalism had already gone through one generation, and a number of uh, Pentecostal pioneers had died, and there was sort of a, a longing to go back to the power of those golden days. Sister Amy goes back to where she began with the downtrodden peoples, and especially African Americans who had been there to help her put up her tents, to take down her tents, to minister with her, and to give out of what they had. She goes back to this community, and in a sense, it's her finding her ground once again. McPherson devoted special attention to the Mexican community of Los Angeles a time when California was discouraging charities from giving aid to immigrants, McPherson opened a commissary stocked with food and clothes, available to everyone. No questions asked, no red tape. If you ask people in Los Angeles about Sister Amy, they may or may not remember whether she was Pentecostal, uh, whether she had her hair bobbed, but everyone remembers the extraordinary contributions of the Angelus Temple Commissary during the Great Depression. They got there first with the most. Even as she fed the poor, McPherson argued that spiritual renewal ranked as the nation's top priority. She preached that economic and social reform would follow when America returned to God. During one 40-city campaign, Sister Amy delivered her unique mix of religion and politics to two million people, one in every 50 Americans. At the same time, she actually re-embraces the Pentecostalism of her childhood. She begins publicly speaking in tongues. She begins being proud of the fact that she was filled with the Spirit. And so we see her not being the Hollywood celebrity, but being the Pentecostal revivalist who is having an impact on individual Christians' lives. In September 1944, McPherson traveled to Oakland, one of the communities that had helped launch her during her early days as an itinerant preacher. One night, she went to bed kind of late because she always felt very keyed up after a performance. And she had some barbiturates, uh, which she frequently used for sleep. The next morning, her son came in to find her to try and get her prepared for this revival she was having in Oakland. And what he discovered was his mother unconscious on the floor. The official coroner's report was that it was accidental death, but her death was reported first as a suicide. In more than three decades as an evangelist, Amy Semple McPherson had touched the lives of millions. More famous than many movie stars, 
she had entwined religion with entertainment and politics to an unprecedented degree. McPherson's story illustrates the rise of a conservative, powerful wing within Christianity that is really trying to blind church and state, that really believes that the United States is a Christian nation, particularly ordained and founded by God, that has a unique role to play in this world. And that's the message she taught her followers, and that's the legacy that she still represents today. A reporter once asked Sister Amy what was her greatest wish in life. As a woman, she said, I would wish that I would have a happy Christian home, a devoted husband and family. But as an evangelist, she said, I would wish that I would have a public address system mighty enough to reach every person in the world with thousands of watts behind her every time she opened her mouth to speak and a radio station that never went off the air during her lifetime. I think it's safe to say that she came a lot closer to fulfilling that desire of her heart. <laughs>